This is God's word. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Kilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel, and the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. And so they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water and the water was parted to the one side and to the other till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven and Elisha saw it and he cried my father my father the chariots of Israel and its horsemen and he saw him no more then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces and he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha, and they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. And they said to him, Behold now, there are with you servants, fifty strong men. Sorry, there are with your servants, fifty strong men. Please let them go and seek your master. It may be that the spirit of the Lord has caught him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, You shall not send. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, Send. They sent therefore fifty men, and for three days they sought him, but did not find him. And they came back to him while he was staying at Jericho, and he said to them, Did I not say to you, Do not go? May the Lord bless to us these readings of his holy inspired word. Today we're thinking about the end of Elijah's ministry and the start of Elisha's one. Endings are often not easy. Beginning a new stage in life can be very challenging and daunting. Think of P7 pupils at primary school. P7s are usually ready to leave their primary school, but their years in the primary level have often been really happy ones for them. 
and everything's become so familiar. And yet they are now at a stage of having to leave and to say farewell to teachers, friends, and all that's familiar. And they're preparing to step out into secondary school, where they're going to be the youngest pupils rather than the eldest, and where everything will be new and unfamiliar, and where they will face many new challenges. Not easy. Or think of the most senior students at secondary school undertaking A-levels. On completing their exams, they'll seek a job in the world of work or go on to third level education. Big changes are involved in both moves and the changes bring many challenges. The ending of different stages in our lives are rarely easy. Stepping out into a new stage of life can be very daunting and stretching. This chapter brings us to the end of one ministry and to the beginning of another. Elijah had served God faithfully and had been used by God mightily. But now it was the Almighty's purpose and time for Elijah to give way to Elisha. This was to be a transition like no other. Elijah wasn't to step off the world stage through retirement or through death. No, Elijah was to be swept up body and soul into heaven itself. Yet Elijah's exit in this extraordinary manner wasn't a total surprise. For Elijah, Elisha and the prophets at both Bethel and Jericho were in the know to some degree. The Lord had revealed to them all something of what was about to happen. But even though Elijah's dramatic departure wasn't a total shock, it was a tremendous challenge for God's faithful people in Israel. Friends, Elijah had been a towering figure for years in Israel. Elijah's spiritual strength and wisdom were renowned. In Israel. Elijah had faithfully and courageously stood for the Lord Almighty and his cause at a critical faith stretching time. And so the prophets and people were all left wondering what is going to become of the Lord's people? What's going to become of us? What's going to become of the Lord's cause now that Elijah, our father, is leaving us? But of course, they needn't have worried. The, the success of God's mission does not rest on individuals, no matter how greatly they're used to bring blessing. The cause of our Lord goes on even when he changes his personnel from one era to another. And that is what was going to happen here. But before Elijah's successor, Elisha, took up his new position, note what happened firstly in this chapter? Let's think together about Elisha's checkup in verses 1 to 10. Before being appointed to certain jobs, many of us have to go through physical or mental checkups to see if we're fit for the tasks involved in the work. Elisha here faced a spiritual checkup before taking the mantle of Elijah's role. By this stage, Elisha had been serving Elijah for perhaps 10 years. It has been a fair stretch of time since Elijah threw his cloak over Elisha's shoulders. Well, here we're told of Elisha's final journey with his master and what a journey it proved to be. Both men realized the end of Elijah's ministry was near. You can imagine it was a very emotional time for the two of them, and not just for them, for the trainee prophets in the schools of Bethel, Jericho and Gilgal were also deeply affected. On this final journey, Elijah visited all these schools. The trainee prophets were surely wondering what lay ahead for them, now that the spiritual giant of a prophet was about to be taken away from them. They must have been wondering if Elisha, his successor, was up to the mark. Was Elisha really ready to step into Elijah's shoes as God's 
primary spokesman, as the leader of the prophets, it was obviously a crucial time for the Lord's people. There was tension in the air. Everybody seemed to be on edge. Baal worship was still a threat. And many were being led astray by false teaching. Such times demanded a strong, wise leader for God's people. They needed somebody who could boldly stand against the flood of idolatry. They needed someone who could strengthen the faith of God's beleaguered people. Elijah had been such a leader, but now he was being taken from them. What about Elisha? Was he up to the task? Such concerns would soon be put to rest as Elisha had this spiritual checkup facing a series of tests. And how Elisha handled these tests revealed his spiritual caliber. The first test revealed Elisha's resolve, his resolve to keep obeying God. Yes, here in this first testing situation, we see Elisha was a man of firm resolve when times demanded. Look again at verse 2. Note what Elijah commanded his younger colleague to do when they got to Gilgal. It was an unusual command for Elisha from his master. Stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. How did Elisha respond to his master's instruction? With strong conviction he declared, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two men went on down to Bethel together. But then in Bethel, Elijah gave a similar strange command to his younger colleague once more. Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. But Elisha gave his master precisely the same response. As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. And so they went on to Jericho together. But in Jericho, Elijah commanded Elisha once again, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. Yet he heard exactly the same reply from his younger partner. As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. And so the two of them walked on together. Now the question arises, why did Elijah command his closest colleague and friend not to come with him on these three occasions? Well, perhaps Elijah wanted privacy as his ministry drew to a close. It was a very poignant time for Elijah leaving the Lord's people. Perhaps he wanted privacy. Or perhaps knowing he was about to be taken from his, this world, he thought it would be best for his beloved younger colleague not to be with him. He may have wished to spare Elisha the pain of parting, the pain of seeing his sudden departure. This is possible. But I believe it's more likely Elijah was testing Elisha's attachment to him and his commitment to the work he was called to. And if that was the case, Three times Elisha vowed his complete commitment to Elijah. For Elisha, leaving Elijah at this key time in his life wasn't an option. And two things in particular tied Elisha to his master Elijah. One was his fear of the Lord. As surely as the Lord lives, Elisha cried three times. Elisha was clearly very conscious of God and of his personal responsibility to God to walk before him in obedience. He was a man who feared the Lord and walked in the fear of God. The second thing was his heart tie to Elijah himself. As surely as the Lord lives and you live, I won't leave you, my master. Elisha evidently had both a great love for the Lord and a great love for his master Elijah. And these factors made him resolved to stay with his master until the very end, no matter how painful it would be. And so Elisha repeatedly stated to Elijah, I'm not going to leave you, I'm not going to leave you, I'm not going to leave you. What commitment he demonstrated, how commendable it was. Friends, Elisha had been serving Elijah for years. Elisha had witnessed with his own eyes the cost of being God's primary spokesman. 
Elisha had seen the weight of the responsibility on Elijah's shoulders and the burden of his work as a prophet. But unlike Demas in the New Testament church, Elisha wasn't put off by the cost of commitment to the Lord's work. And Elisha wasn't seduced by the pull of the world. Demas had served with the Apostle Paul in God's work, but then tragically, Demas had turned his back on Paul and on Christ's mission. The cost of commitment was too high in Demas's eyes, and the things of the world were so attractive to Demas. Well, Elisha wasn't like that. Elisha wasn't a man to turn his back on the work of the Lord. He was marked by loyalty to the Lord. Elisha was characterized by wholehearted commitment to his calling, whatever the cost. Christian friends demonstrating such loyalty is a decision of the will. And it is a vital quality in Christian living. Today, I must ask you, is loyalty a mark of your life? If you're married, are you demonstrating loyalty within your marriage? When it comes to your friends, do you show, do you show loyalty in your friendships? Are you someone who stands by your friends in times of trial and need? And what about your commitment to Christ himself? Are you demonstrating loyalty to your Lord day by day? Are you wholeheartedly committed to your King and to his cause in this generation in which he's placed you? Or are you being pulled away by the things of this world? Is your heart turning from your Saviour and from serving him in costly ways? Does living for the Lord and standing for his truth seem too demanding to you? Are you being drawn to the dazzling lights and sounds of this world in its rebellion against our King? Elisha's resolve was firm, and that must be true of you and me too. Your resolve to wholehearted commitment to Christ and his mission must not waver. It must be steadfast by the help of the Spirit. In the second test he faced, we see Elisha's rejection, his rejection of pessimistic counsel. Everywhere Elisha went with Elijah at this time, Elisha met fellow believers coming out with depressing comments. When he and Elijah were leaving Bethel, the prophet said to him, Do you know the Lord is going to take your master from you today? And then when the two men were ready to leave Jericho, the prophets there said the very same thing to Elisha. Well, in both cases, Elisha responded curtly and pointedly. Yes, I know, but don't speak of it. What was this all about? What was going on here? Well, it seems these prophets, these trainee prophets, were drawing a very depressing conclusion from the fact that Elijah was about to be taken away. Their gloomy conclusion was this. What are we going to do after Elijah has gone? How will we ever cope? What will become of God's cause? Things look utterly hopeless without him. That is what these guys were communicating in their question to Elisha. But Elisha would have none of it. Elisha wouldn't listen to their litany of woes. Elisha cut them off before they had a chance to say any more about their gloomy, pessimistic outlook. Christian friends, we must follow Elisha's example here too. We must also reject melancholy, gloomy counsel. Don't listen to those in the church who only focus on negative things in church life and on our weaknesses. The failings of any congregation are often evident to all, and it's easy to focus on them. Of course, such sins and shortcomings must be recognised and addressed, and unrighteousness in church life must be acknowledged and repented of. We must seek to rectify things that aren't right and improve things that aren't as good as they should be. But we're not to be preoccupied with our weaknesses. We are called to be believers, and so we are to be trusting in the Lord. We're to be walking by faith in him each day. King Jesus is our all-sufficient saviour. And he has all the resources of heaven and earth at his fingertips. The world and its riches belong to our king. And so our master 
is in a position to provide for all of our needs. Therefore, we've got to be like Elisha. We have to reject a kind of pessimism that makes our work for the Lord seem hopeless. We must fill our minds with the precious promises of our Supreme Saviour, seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness by the enabling of his Spirit. Our Saviour, having triumphed over death, has ascended to heaven and he's enthroned in glory and all of his purposes will be completely fulfilled. His mission will be accomplished and all of his people in every generation will be saved. Everyone for whom he died on the cross will be brought home to heaven. And so we've got to follow Elisha's example in rejecting gloomy counsellors. In his third test, we see Elisha's request, his request for God's power. At last, Elijah and Elisha reached the river Jordan. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went to the Jordan and watched from a distance. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up and struck the water. It looked ridiculous, humanly speaking, I'm quite sure. But the water parted to the one side and to the other. And the two of them walked over on dry ground. Well, when they crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken from you. What an opportunity this was for Elisha. Elijah was giving him something like a blank check. All Elisha had to do was to fill in the amount. Friends, if we really want to know where we are spiritually, we can put ourselves in Elisha's shoes at this point. What would you ask for from God if you could have anything at all? What would you ask for from the Lord of heaven who owns absolutely all things? Young folk, what would you ask for? Those of us who are older, what would we, we ask for? It's very telling what Elisha asked for. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, he said to his master. What did he mean? Well, amongst God's people in Israel, the eldest son received a double portion of his father's inheritance. Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 17. A man must acknowledge the firstborn by giving him a double share of all that he has. Elisha had been called by God to be Elijah's successor as his primary spokesman. Therefore, Elisha considered himself to be the firstborn among the prophets of that time. In asking for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, it showed Elisha wanted to be confirmed as the true successor, as the heir of Elijah. And it also showed that Elisha was totally aware of the greatness of the task. Elisha was well aware that Elijah's weighty role as God's prophet had involved undertaking some really difficult duties and some extremely demanding tasks. Friends, Elijah had had to confront godless royals, Ahab and Jezebel, front on. Not an easy thing to do. Elijah had had to expose and denounce idolatry and demon worship amongst his own fellow countrymen in Israel. Not an easy thing to do. Elijah had had to minister to those in very pressing need. Not an easy thing to do. And so Elisha knew that in becoming God's prophet, he would have to put his life on the line. And he'd have to risk poverty and unpopularity. And he'd have to live as a servant to minister to those in desperate circumstances. And he was very conscious of his own weakness and insufficiency and need for God's empowering to carry out such service. Elisha felt his inadequacy for this rule acutely. And he knew that he could never do it without the Spirit's enabling. And so he made this his top request. Now, my Christian friend, what do you ask God for in prayer day by day, mostly? What do you most pray for 
for yourself day by day. Elisha's top request should be your top request. You should come to your heavenly father daily and ask him to fill you afresh with his Holy Spirit. Your Savior is calling you to do this, to make such a request. Jesus says to you and me, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Luke 11, verse 10. Friends, living the Christian life is supernatural. You can't live for Jesus without his Spirit's daily empowering. Day by day, you've got to be asking your Heavenly Father to be leading and controlling and directing you by his Spirit. Because only then will you be walking in the Spirit and abiding in Christ. And only then will you be worshipping in the Spirit and meeting with Christ. And only then will you be witnessing in the Spirit and sharing the Gospel of Christ. And only then will you be praying in the Spirit and seeking Christ's glory and the advance of his kingdom and righteousness. Friends, as Elisha was about to take on this great responsibility, he went through this spiritual checkup and he responded to each test with God-given wisdom and a humble servant heart. His resolve to keep serving Elijah was firm, rock-solid firm. He was wholly committed to his calling. His rejection of faithless, gloomy counsellors was firm. He wouldn't listen to their pessimistic, despondent conclusions. His request for the Spirit's help was wise. He asked for exactly what he needed. Therefore, by God's grace, Elisha came through his spiritual checkup in a way which proved his suitability for the new role, role that God was giving him. Well, we come now to the second and last part of this episode. Elisha's confirmation. His confirmation as Elijah's successor. Elijah had promised Elisha he would receive his request for the Spirit's power if he saw Elijah taken up. Verse 10, you've asked a difficult thing, yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise not. Well, as they were walking along and talking together, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And then Elisha saw his dear master no more. Elisha cried out these stirring words because he realized that Elijah's godly ministry had been a tremendous strength and blessing to God's people. He had been the father of the faithful in Israel. He hadn't just been their prophet, he'd also been their protector, their defender. He'd been the one God had used to protect his people at a time of great persecution and hardship. And so Elisha saw a spectacular and startling sight. And he also saw Elijah's cloak drop to the ground. Well, he picked it up immediately. He knew it was a sign that his request had been granted. His beloved master had left him his cloak. But Elijah hadn't left him bereft, impoverished and powerless. The double portion of his spirit had come upon him. At that moment, Elisha tore off the clothes of a trainee. He shedded his apprentice's uniform. He picked up the cloak of the prophet. There could be no going back now. He was Elijah's successor for sure. But it was, only, it was important not only for him to know that, the other prophets needed to realise that too. They needed to see that there was no reason to despair about the cause of the Lord. Elijah's vital work would be carried on by Elisha. To confirm Elisha's position in the eyes of the other prophets, the Lord immediately did two things in this new ministry. First of all, the Lord parted the Jordan. Immediately, Elisha went back to the river Jordan with Elijah's cloak in his hand. And he did the same humanly seeming, humanly looking ridiculous thing before the prophets that they'd seen Elijah do. Elisha struck the water with the cloak and he cried out, Where is the Lord? 
the God of Elijah. And so Elisha called upon the Lord to demonstrate his almighty power. He cried to God to manifest the spirit and power of Elisha. And his cry for help was answered instantly. The water of the Jordan immediately parted and Elisha was able to cross over in exactly the same way he and Elijah had done. There could be no doubt in the minds of the prophets at that point that the spirit of Elijah now rested on Elisha. And they came to meet him. They bowed to the ground before him. Friends, how did God demonstrate that Moses was the approved leader? By using Moses to lead the people through the Red Sea. How did God confirm that Joshua was his approved successor to Moses? By having Joshua lead the people through the River Jordan into the Promised Land. Well, God now showed everyone Elisha was Elijah's successor by dividing the Jordan for him as he did for Elijah. And so Elisha was confirmed as Elijah's successor by this miraculous crossing of the Jordan. But he was also confirmed as Elijah's successor by the Lord taking Elijah straight to heaven. And this was confirmed by Elijah's body not being found. Of course, the prophets were determined to find their master's body. But Elijah told them that their search would be futile. Yet the prophets pressurized Elijah to permit this search. They perhaps thought that only Elijah, Elijah's soul had been taken to heaven. Or perhaps they thought that Elijah was only taken part of the way to heaven before being cast down to earth in some valley or on some mountainside. Under pressure, Elisha consented to their search. But of course, as he had said, it proved to be futile. The prophets were now convinced that Elisha had witnessed something absolutely astounding. Elisha had seen Elijah transported body and soul to glory. In their eyes, this gave Elisha even more stature as Elijah's successor. And so Elisha was confirmed as Elijah's successor through these mighty miracles. Having had his spiritual checkup and passing every test, he was confirmed in everyone's eyes as God's new prime prophet. And therefore Elisha's ministry as God's main spokesman began with extraordinary encouragement. May we all learn from the example of the servant of God. May we learn from his resolve to walk in God's ways no matter what the cost. May we learn from his rejection of negative depressing counsel no matter how grave the challenges we face. May we learn from his request for a double portion of Elijah's spirit and ask our Heavenly Father every day, every morning you get out of your bed, ask your Heavenly Father for his spirit's filling and leading in every part of your life and service. May the Lord help us all. Let us join in prayer together again.